Okay, let's make a start. Um, welcome, it's great to see you and, um, and to have a chance to spend the next 90 minutes or so talking about the expression of interest stage of the Salt Grant. I want to begin, of course, by acknowledging the custodians of all of the lands on which we live, work and learn and to pay my respects to First Nations people past, present and future and to anybody who's in this group today who is First Nations to particularly recognise your presence and involvement here. Um, by way of introduction, um, I'm going to ask each of you, if you would, um, to reflect on your grant idea. And I'm hoping that um, you'll be willing to share it with the whole group, but no pressure to. Um, this process is Competitive to some extent, but much more value is derived from it um, by being collaborative. And as you move through the process, um, as you are successful in your EOIs and you progress forward through the support program that Matt and Marlene um, shepherd and that I'm fortunate to be involved in as well, um, you will see that sharing your ideas with others is a really central part of, of how we get things done here in Salt Grant. So, I'm going to encourage that we start in the spirit in which we intend to continue by inviting you to jump right in and share your grant idea. I'm imagining that at this point you've got a pretty firm idea of what it is you'd like to research, um, or at the very least you're going to know the kind of domain that you're keen to affect some change in, or deepen your understanding of, or become an advocate for, or whatever you're kind of driving for. So I want to give you not very long, let's say two minutes, to write down five key words to describe your idea. And you'll see in the example that I've done, I kind of put keyword as a broad term um, and so it's sort of key phrase slash sentence. Um, but write down the five things that describe your grant idea. And if you're willing to share them in the chat window, that would be superb. Um, it will help people to get a bit of a reading of what we're all working on and just to start to get to know each other. All right, we've heard from one person already whose actual name I don't know um, because it looks like a username there. I'm um, investigating AR and VR. Who is that, Mummy? I think that's Ken. Ken oh, Howard. super, Ken. Fantastic. So tapping into one of the 2019 PBC Learning and Teaching Priorities. What else are people working on? You can share all the keywords or just a few of them, it's up to you. Or if you'd rather unmute your mic and tell us, you're welcome to do that as well. Fantastic. STEM um, teaching in VET, another very, very topical one. Um, and one of the new priorities that emerged in this year's procedures, so it's great to see that one getting picked up. And then Abdul, marking management of large classes, don't we need that, my goodness. And Wes working on Transitions Career Pathways and an acronym that is escaping me. What does SUN stand for? Uh, start Uni Now. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Fabulous. Jamie, Pilot Training, Artificial Intelligence, Mixed Reality Learning and Fun. Fantastic. Now, is that pilot training as in testing out a new idea or training people to fly aeroplanes? Training people to fly aeroplanes, yes, for training them in a simulator, which we're going to get here in Cairns quite soon. Superb. Now, I have to admit that I didn't know that at CQU um, there was an aeronautics pilot program. Is it new or am I just out of touch? It's been here for a couple of years. I'm new. Yeah, I've only been here for a, a uh -huh. month or so, but the, the pilot oh. program has been here for a, a couple of years, yeah, and growing yeah. rapidly. Uh -huh. Oh, that's really exciting. Yeah. And great to see you jumping in and applying for funding through these grants right away. It's um, an, excellent, an excellent thing to get involved in. Thank you, Tilly. Anyone else? Okay, so we've got a real mix, which is fantastic, and, um, and the reflections with the project topics are really clear, including, like I was saying, the, the new ARVR priority of the PBC, and then also the new VET focus that's in the list of um, project topics. So, um, our plan for today, essentially, 
we're going to be really pragmatic because time is short, life is short, you've all got other things you need to be doing and I want you to go away from this workshop with a really tangible sense of having made progress on the EOI document and understanding it more deeply. Um, so we're going to work through it step by step. That's the bulk of, of this webinar, this 90 minutes we have together. Then we're going to touch on a planning tool that applicants last year found very useful, um, which is a Lean Canvas. Some of you might have come across it if you've ever dabbled in the kind of business management, entrepreneurship, startup kind of world. Um, we've got an adapted version that I worked on back in 2017 um, that is customized for scholarship of learning and teaching research, and then it's further customized to calibrate exactly with Central Queensland new requirements. So we're going to touch on that so that you know that you have that at your disposal. We're going to talk about formulating effective research questions and you're going to spend some time doing just that. And then a little um, hidden extra, we are going to touch on the fine art of writing and then we will have time at the end for Q&A. Having said that, um, I would love you to interrupt at any point during our time together with comments, questions, you can do it by typing or by unmuting your mic, whichever works. Um, if you ask about something that we're just about to get up to, I might hold off on your question, but other than that, very, very happy to take um, your advice, really, about what's the most useful way to spend this time. And if you have a burning question, a comment, an idea, anything, please do jump in with it as we go along. Don't feel like you have to save it up. Matt touched on this in the um, introductory webinar that we did a little while ago, um, but I just wanted to reiterate it here. It really is an opportunity for you to get early feedback from the review panel from the same people who will be making final recommendations for the PVC learning and teaching. Um, for them to be able to eyeball your idea and make an assessment of two things, really, feasibility and relevance. It's a required step in the process, um, partly to give you space to kind of develop and think through and pitch your ideas, but also because nobody wants you to be spending a whole lot of time writing a cumbersome long grant application for an idea that maybe, you know, isn't, hasn't found its feet, isn't being pitched at the right moment in time, has been done already. It's, um, it's an opportunity to, to make sure that you get a really early indication of whether you are likely to have an idea that has say that or not. It's an exercise in brevity. It's limited to four pages. And while sometimes it's tempting to think, oh, it's only four pages, what a relief, writing that briefly can be a challenging thing to do, as I'm sure many of you have experienced in different contexts. Um, so being brief is um, is certainly part of the game and there are some resources that I'll share um, that assist in that brevity exercise but I guess the main one is to to really use the EOI template for the purpose that it was intended and we're going to work through that in the next series of slides. Don't try and do more in the EOI that it, than it asks of you. It asks some very particular questions and if you can keep your focus pretty laser tight on that then you'll be well positioned to stay within the limits and um, it's important as well not to not to push those limits by doing things like shrinking the margin, removing paragraph breaks, making the font a tiny size and so on. It's clear in the procedures that you need to stick to the template kind of as it is and make it work. Marlene? Yes, can I just mention that that box of um, information at the top of the expression of interest can be removed. So you can start your, your expression of interest with the project title. So that, that information is not necessary when you lodge it, but yeah, it's necessary for you to read through so that you get the expression of interest right. Which is fantastic because that just won you like half a page of extra space. <laughs> and, uh, and the final point is that it's a, a relatively low intensity way to test out your ideas and um, to get some early feedback. So those two questions that the review panel's asking when they look at your EOI are um, a question of feasibility and a question of relevance. So essentially, can it be done? 
can it be done with the money that's available? Either there are two levels of funding in the SALT grants, so can it be done with that level of money? Can it be done by the combination of people that are proposed in the project team? And can it be done given the kind of risks and constraints that may exist in the area that you're seeking to work in? So this is really a kind of confidence question. Can the panel be convinced that um, this is an idea that is possible, that it's feasible, and can they confidently go to Josh as PBC and say, yeah, we believe in this idea, we reckon that it's within the scope, it's the right people doing it, and even though it might be tough going, we believe that it's possible. And then the second question, this one of relevance, is really a question of, is it worth doing? Something might be possible, but not especially worthwhile. So is it worth doing in light of what's been done already, both at CQU and beyond, in terms of research and practice? A pretty regular criticism that comes back from panels um, at CQ Uni, but more broadly as well, is this research is nothing new, it's been done before. Um, or maybe the particular take on it hasn't been done before, but there's a whole body of work that just hasn't been referenced in the application um, or in the EOI. So important to couch what you're proposing in terms of what exists already. The kind of the worst thing that you can read in an application is um, there is no existing research in this field. Um, because there always will be, there'll always be something, perhaps it's in a different discipline, but it's about the same kind of intervention. Or perhaps it's in the same discipline, exploring the same problem, but not proposing the intervention that you're proposing. There'll be some combination of variables that allows you to find a body of literature and or practice um, that, that shows that this work is worth doing. And yes, Ken, the EOI says be pretty minimal about your references, but you just want to use enough that it, it shows that you understand the, the kind of domain that you're working in. You can signal that with references. You can also signal it by using language, and we'll touch on that a bit more in a while. Um, even though you only include a couple of references, your I imagine in the EOI process from from walking alongside other people who've done this, you're going to be looking at a, a broader body of research, um, even at this EOI stage, although you're not going to cite it. Molly. And it does mention in instructions that it's not necessary at this stage for a comprehensive list, but at the proposal stage it will be necessary. So if you're thinking about references now, then you know keep track of them track so that you can put them into your proposal later. Definitely, definitely. And there's other ways as well that you signal this existing research and practice thing. It might be an orienting sentence where you say, Central Queensland University has invested in a comprehensive survey of equity related projects across the university. However, they have, there has not yet been a project that, um, I don't know, examines the implementation of these in a, um, on the CANS campus. That's not the makings of a great research project, but you get the point that I'm making, that you signal that you know what's going on, and then you signal how you're going to augment what's happening. Yes, some good things have happened in terms of knowing what's going on with equity, but there's also this big opportunity that's worth paying some attention to and proposing what that is. And so, the next kind of part of that is, is it worth doing in terms of institutional priorities? So the great thing about SALT grants, one of the many great things, is that you've got a really clear list of project topics. And so you don't have to be guessing about what matters to the institution. You have to be just pitching your project to one of those topics in the procedures, and then you know that you're on track. You know that you're tapping into an institutional priority. If you can show that not only is it in that list, but it's also, let's say, for example, an active concern of your deputy dean learning and teaching, that it's also something that you already have traction with um, in your discipline group or with a group of colleagues, all the better. And then the other thing is, is it worth doing at this time? You know, some ideas haven't found their moment yet. In the deep research that I was involved in years and years ago now, 
um, we talked about this idea of climate of readiness for change. Um, are people in a position to adopt the kinds of changes that you're going to propose from your project? Is there an appetite? Is there a hunger for doing something differently? And maybe this is not the time um, for your particular idea or your particular approach. So the EOI is a way of thinking those things through, communicating them to the panel, um, summarising them for yourself and then getting yourself ready to um, to write the full proposal if you are invited to do so. So we're just going to work through the EOI document um, and for most of the sections I've kind of got a list of things that I'd encourage you to do and things that I'd encourage you to avoid. These slides will be available so don't feel any need to write everything down unless it suits your learning style to do that. Um, and we're just working through them really from top to bottom. So starting with project title and the team. Um, make the title clear and something catchy if you can, um, but if you have to choose one or the other, choose clear. Um, a catchy title can come much later on. When um, we did the d -cubed project, I think the original title of that, it took up about three lines on an A4 page and it was like a review of the blah, 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 or in the context of something, 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 you know, like the name went on forever and you would never successfully be able to use that once the project began, but it, it worked well enough to propose the project for national funding. Um, it was clear about what we were seeking to do, and so that's a higher priority. But if you can make it catchy as well, then all the better. Um, the review panel are people who will be reading a whole bunch of these. You want them to have an, an easy and a um, magnetic kind of way to remember yours. Um, include team members that you work well with. This, this might seem like an obvious point, and I really want to encourage you to um, reflect on this. Some people in scholarship of learning and teaching include people because they think they should on the team. And um, it never ever works out. So make sure that the people you include are people that you genuinely have good working relationships with or you'd like to. If there are difficult people who, for some reason, you need them on your team, like they are in a position of leadership within your context and you know that they'll be, um, that it would be better to have them in the tent than outside of it, you know, if there's a strategic need to involve team members that are difficult to work with, then I'd really encourage you to find ways to kind of corral the potential difficulties perhaps by putting them on a reference group rather than making them a team member, having them as a mentor or consultant rather than a team member. Just um, think really strategically about how to deal with the complex interpersonal dynamics that um, these grants invariably can throw into our path. Um, and again, build your team to match the skills and knowledge needed. So if you're doing something in um, virtual reality and you're really strong on the curriculum side of things but you haven't you haven't done developmental work in VR and AR maybe you're bringing somebody in from completely outside of your discipline who is strong on that tech side um, if you know that you're going to need high levels of engagement with students maybe you're bringing somebody in who's got a, a student leadership background or a marketing background or a social media background. So really think about what your project needs and how you can build a team to do that. And then one of the words that you're going to hear a lot of as we work together on salt grants is this idea of generalizability. So CQU, one of the things that it wants from these projects is that the ripple effects of them will go beyond their immediate context and affect students elsewhere. Um, perhaps it will be a project that exists in a particular unit but is then generalizable to other first year students or generalizable to other capstone placement units or could be generalized into a different discipline um, entirely. And so one of the ways to do that is to in your team have somebody who embodies the, um, the place that you think your project could generalized to um, because that way you'll have a voice on the team 
reflecting and guiding and suggesting, well, you know, that's interesting that it works that way in occupational therapy because in nursing, it's actually this other way. Um, or to be checking you on you know, the language choices that you're making or the presumptions perhaps. Um, much more productive and exciting, I think, to build that into your team composition than to get to the end and think, all right, now how on earth do we make this magnetic and interesting to um, you know, diet dietetics lecturers when we haven't engaged them in the conversation all the way through? Um, things to avoid tokenistic team members who are there in name only. Um, make sure everybody has a really genuine role. Um, and don't get too overly fancy with your title. You do need the title to describe what it is you will be doing. Um, we've got a question from Naratum asking if a sample EOI could be submitted. And Marlene, I can't remember if we share examples of successful EOIs or not. Can you refresh my memory? I would have to get permission from the actual author. So, yeah, that will be sometime in the future. <laughs> uh huh. Okay, thanks so for that. Uh, because down the line, we. Okay. Sorry, Tilly. Um, <laughs> further down the line, we do look at extracts from successful applications. Um, so, if your EOI is successful and you then come to, let's say, the face to face workshop that's happening in June, we'll be looking at real examples then of people's applications. But, yeah, the sample EOI. To be honest, so much of it will be really specific to what you're proposing. Um, but even in the absence of an example, I, I think you're going to know what to say. A lot of the information Marilyn, is... Do you want to say anything else on that? Or Molly? I was just going to say that a lot of the information that's required is actually in the blue text under the headings. So it's it's your idea. If you're looking at someone else's expression of interest, that's about their idea. So, I mean, you can get some general information, but it's it's there as well yeah yeah definitely all right funding level that's the next part of the application so um things to do make some rough calculations to to get a ballpark sense of um whether you're in the smaller or the larger of the funding categories um if you can compare your project with others that have been funded so Funding announcements are made each year by way of, Marlene, correct me if I'm wrong, by way of an email from Josh to the university community. And so it would be worth looking back at those and seeing are there people doing similar work to you um, and, and whether they were funded at the smaller or the larger level and even to start having, although it's not needed in any depth at all for the EOI stage, but to start the ball rolling of asking some of those teams perhaps if they'd be willing to support or mentor you by sharing some of those budgets. You're not doing a budget for the EOI, so this is kind of seeding some early ideas. Um, you might not want to give it a huge amount of priority at this point. But one thing that I would encourage you to do early on is to use the RAW, the Research Activity Workbook. For some reason that I have to confess I don't fully understand, people seem to feel trepidation about the RAW. Um, what it does is makes a whole lot of complicated calculations for you, particularly about salary levels, um, that are just vastly easier to do in the Excel spreadsheet of the RAW rather than trying to figure them out on your own. So I'd just, encourage you, again, you're not submitting that at this stage, but I'd encourage you to use it to do your salary calculations um, early on. Marlene. Yeah, and I'm in, the, I'm in the process of actually updating it so it's a lot simpler. There's only the two spreadsheets in it now, but it's still based on the CPU salary from the enterprise agreement. So, um, yeah, um, I've tried to simplify it so that it looks similar to what you need to put into your proposal. Fabulous. Good, good. Um, and then the final one is that um, most projects have a fairly substantial amount of in-kind contributions. So um, either actual cash or in-kind contributions, things that um, you know have a value but are not actual money, um, like your time, for example. Um, Having conversations to seek those out early will help position you really well for writing a compelling budget in the end. 
in-kind contributions have value in a couple of different ways. So one of them obviously is that it gives you more leverage and traction because you just have more resources behind your project. But the other and, and possibly more powerful aspect of in-kind contributions is that they interweave your ambitions with the ambitions of other people within the institution because those people have co-invested in what you're seeking to achieve. So if you have a DDLT, you have a dean, you have a head of discipline um, who is actively buying into your project by making in-kind contribution, who's saying, look, you can have our level five admin person for you know a half a day a week to work on your data analysis, you can use our, you know, brand new um, computer that is arriving that can do these high level calculations, you can be the first super user of that, you can, um, I'm going to bankroll you attending a conference because I can see that it's really powerful and effective for what you're seeking to do in the project, you know, all of that, it invests people in your success. And because the end game of these salt grants is all about changing practice at CQU, it has some other purposes as well, contributing to the literature, engaging in scholarship and so on. But one of the fundamental reasons for these grants is to make a difference to how students learn and to how academics work and teach. Um, the more buy-in you've got from people in positions of power, the stronger a position you're gonna be in. In terms of things to avoid, um, obviously avoid being unrealistic in your project scope. These projects are relatively small and relatively brief. So be careful of being tempted to do too much. Be careful of comparing what you're seeking to do with perhaps national Office for Learning and Teaching grants that you remember seeing happen a few years ago um, when the OLT and its predecessors were actively funding. Make sure that you're you're building your aspirations for your grant on a realistic basis. That these are funded to the effect of five or ten thousand dollars, and they run for twelve months. So you're not going to be able to do everything. Be careful about um, budgeting for items which are restricted, and also be careful of overlooking important budget items and those numbers there just link you into the procedures um, of where you'll find more information. So then um, the next kind of cluster of things in the EOI is the topic, the need for the project, and the intended aim. So obviously you're going to be drawing on literature, practice, what's really going on, and data. Um, are there things that you know, either from the, your own data sets that you collect in um, unit coordination and um, course coordination, is there data available nationally or institutionally that points to this project being necessary? One of the things that can be really useful in this stage of thinking about things is to ask yourself the question, what would be lost if the project didn't happen now? Um, which is a kind of, um, it's a bit of a, it invites you to do a bit of uh, catastrophe imagination, a bit of catastrophizing. Um, to think about, well, yeah, what would be lost? Like, would students be, you know, less equipped for the workplace? Would um, industry partners not have a, a road into connecting with academic research? Like, what would the consequence be of the project not happening? And either in the EOI or perhaps later in the um, application process, you can even kind of state that in your application. You know, this. This research is crucial because without it, this will be the consequence. I mentioned before that idea of climate of readiness for change. Um, so indicate that there is a readiness for change in your immediate context for sure, and then on that topic of generalizability beyond your immediate context, if there are things you can say on that front as well. Um, and then the last thing, which I'm sure you're all doing, is to have strategic conversations as part of your grants development process. And this, again, is all about um, interweaving people with your mission, making it a project that is shared amongst others. We've got a question in the chat about, can we team up with other universities? 
And Marlene, the answer is yes, but with some restrictions. Is that right? I've just put my response up there. The procedure states oh, in the perfect. eligibility section that you can only have one non-CQU team member. So, um, yeah. And again, um, that's a great protection for you because if you had more than that, you would be spending a lot of your time wrangling people and, um, and for a project, again, of this kind of scale and scope. Um, it makes sense that it's largely CPU, perhaps with one um, external person. And so things to be careful of when you're doing this section of the EOI. Um, you know how when you know a field really well, things in it can seem really obvious to you and we sometimes forget to actually say them out loud or write them in applications. And so I'd really urge you to be cautious about writing as if the need for the project is obvious or self-evident. It won't be necessarily to your review panel. So treat the review panel like a group of intelligent but non-expert readers of your application. And one of the extreme ways you can test this out, which may or may not work for you, but I'd be interested if you were keen to try it to know how it went, is to Imagine, or actually, if you have access to a child, imagine explaining your grant project to a child, like a, I don't know, like a nine-year-old, or an eight, a precocious eight-year-old. Um, how would you tell them the story of the importance of your project when they don't have all the reference points that you have got to your discipline? Um, and then, once you've done that, make sure you touch on those, those key kind of touchstone concepts in um, in how you write your EOI. Be careful of proposing work in a vacuum. Um, there will always be, like I said before, there'll always be work that, that has a bearing on what you're proposing to do. So make sure that you know about it and acknowledge it. Marlene and Matt are fantastic sources of that information because they obviously have been shepherding these grants through the process um, for quite some time. And, uh, and so I'd really urge you to have conversations with them about where your work might sit in what's already been funded. And that leads to that final point of be careful that you don't propose research that's been done before. So I'm going to pause talking for a moment and invite you to um, have a think about your own project again. Just and your, um, sorry, sorry, Tilly, just on your last point yeah. before we move on, um, there yeah. is a list of previously funded projects on the on the um, learning and teaching staff net site. So if people go on there, they can download that list and it's got a, the list of investigators, etc. if you wanted to contact any of them, that sort of thing. Fantastic. Thank you, that's great. Okay, so over to you. You've got two minutes to, um, to think about, and we won't share this one. I'm just gonna leave this as one for your own reflection, to think about what would be lost if the project was not funded and didn't proceed at this time. Um, and you might want to frame that in terms of students or staff or the school or the unit, up to you. But just a few minutes to pause. I know I've kind of poured a whole lot of information at you. Um, a few minutes to pause and think about your project. What would be lost if it wasn't funded at this time? So I kind of describe this as the ransom note element of grant application writing. And you might not necessarily want to frame it in your EOI or your application in this way. But kind of think about it as a ransom note, like if I don't get this money, there'll be consequences and this is what they are. Um, soften it when you write that on paper. But that's kind of the, the ethos of asking this question because you do want to convince the panel that there is a sense of both timeliness and urgency, that there is a set of conditions that means that this is the right time to do it and that delaying would have adverse consequences the students, the institution, the opportunity, whatever it might be. Project design, um, the next section um, in the EOI. So sometimes when we make this transition from discipline-based research into scholarship of learning and teaching, it's easy to feel like a novice, like we have no idea how this mysterious soul can get there. But essentially, 
you often will use the, sim the same kinds of approaches, methodologies, methods, um, that you use in your discipline-based research, you'll carry them across into salt work as well. Scholarship of Learning and Teaching is a very broad church, and within it there are all kinds of ways of seeking meaning and making meaning, many of which scholars have brought um, from their discipline and transferred across into looking at um, how it is that students learn and academic teach. If you have an appetite for doing something that's outside of your discipline-based research comfort zone, you might want to ask yourself questions like, what approaches are you drawn to in the literature and what strengths exist in your team? So um, because these grants are, um, well, they're several things, right? They're merit-based, they're um, quick turnaround, and they have, you know, appropriately high expectations that um, your research will be engaging and make a difference. This is probably not the context in which you want to leap into some kind of research approach that you have never engaged with before and you're not really sure if you're um, comfortable with it or not, but you think you might give it a red hot go. Much better in these projects to propose a research design that is within the, the feasible, viable comfort zone of your team. Um, use that blue text in the EOI to really guide you about what you need to include, signalling to your readers that you, you have a, a plan, you have a plan of action for how things are going to go. And because you don't have a huge amount of space, you can use some kind of shorthanding to show that you really are across the domain that you're working in. So, for example, if you are proposing to use grounded theory where you start with the evidence and then you kind of build backwards to, um, to develop a theory rather than, um, as happens in most research, you know, starting from the literature and, and building forward, then you're going to want to mention the names Glasser and Strauss, who were, you know, the key thinkers in that field. If you're talking about action research, you're probably going to reference somebody like Kurt Lewin. If you're talking about dissemination um, in an Australian context, you're probably going to be mentioning the work that Deanne Ganaway and I have done um, over the last, how long has it been, 12 years or something, um, and some earlier projects as well around dissemination. You kind of can shorthand that you get it, that you're across all of that by just naming the right person. And the panel will be able to build confidence that you mean the same thing that they mean in terms of dissemination, for example, if you that, um, that source. Impact and success, the next section of the EOI. Um, impact is defined in, in various ways. Um, this is how I defined it in the work that influenced the national grant funding process back in the good old days where we had one, where there were national grants. Um, it's a super simple definition, but I think it does the job. Impact is the difference that a project makes within its sphere of influence, both during and after the funding period. So um, this idea is that impact is about the actual change, not that a new resource got made or a new framework got printed, but actually what did it do? Like what on the ground was different for students, for institutions, for academic staff? and so on. And also this definition acknowledges that change is never instant um, and so before and after, uh, sorry, during and after the funding period are the two kind of essential moments. So things to do here, define the sphere of influence, be specific and purposeful, um, showing that the project has been designed for impact, that you have the same change focus that um, the PDC Learning and Teaching has, that Matt and Marlene have, that the review panel have. You want to build confidence in the reviewers that you have designed your project to make a difference. And be excited about it, right, in such a way that the review panelists um, get that you care about this work. Not, um, yeah, I mean, you'll get that tenor right in the why You don't want to be kind of, you know, screaming with excitement about it, but you want to show that you genuinely care and, and that's a really appropriate thing to do. Things to avoid. Um, a killer word in an EOI or a grant application is the word hope. 
Um, I'm a massive believer in hope in every other aspect of my life except for writing funding applications. You need to do better than hope that some kind of change will eventuate. You need to plan for it. You need to structure it into your research design. Um, so don't say, we hope that this will change student learning for everybody in first year at CQ. Hope's not going to be enough to do that. And the other thing is, be careful of presuming that people will just adopt your innovation, you know, that you will just like make a thing and they will come. Or what I call the bequeathing approach, which is you make a polished final product and then you take it out to the world and you kind of gift it to other people who chances are the research shows are going to look at it and say, yeah, you know what, not relevant to my work, doesn't reflect my reality, not interested in making that change. But think about how can you engage people throughout the life of the project to convince them that change is not only possible, but it's crucial, and then to empower them to use the findings of your project um, to, to make that change happen. And then make sure that your impact and success section is well connected um, with the other sections of the EOI, make sure it lines up really well with the project topic, with the aims, the need for the project, and so on. And then the final part of the EOI, and I'm going to say the easiest part to write, is um, there's a space at the end for any open questions. This is where you pose questions to the panel um, of, of, um, of sorry, you give guidance to the panel about what kinds of support um, you would like in the application process and also just let the panel know anything else that's going on with you um, in terms of the grant project. And there's two purposes to this. Um, one is that what you write in there will change how we provide support to you over the next several months. It will change what we do together at the face-to-face -to -face workshop. It will change the content of the webinars. Um, we're very much about tailoring all of this support to you. Um, and so this is a chance for you to have a whole lot of agency in deciding um, how you are supported. But the second thing it does is that it demonstrates to the review panel that you are reflective, engaged, and in a growth mindset, which is the kind of person that um, the review panel wants to be funding or the kind of team that they want to be funding. Um, rather than a team that thinks that they maybe already have all the answers. So that is the EOI. One of the areas that people struggle with a lot is posing research questions. And so I've got a few slides on those. But let me just ask if there's any EOI related questions on you know, the document itself, the headings, the prompts underneath the headings, anything you need to know before we drill down into the research questioning component. Okay, so um, starting at a really obvious place, the approach that you are proposing could be quantitative, it could be qualitative, or it could be mixed methods. And you're using, no matter what approach you're using, you're going to have research questions that frame your research at every stage of the process that guide you about um, what you need to know and the manner in which you're seeking to know it. There's a useful um, taxonomy of questions that came out of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. So Pat Hutchings, she went through um, countless, I, I actually don't know how many, but a significant number of funded grant projects in the United States and identified this taxonomy of what kinds of questions are people asking in Scholarship of Learning and Teaching? That link on the slide um, will take you to the full text of her book, which was a fantastic online discovery. Um, what she came to is that there are four kinds of questions that we ask in SALT, and these are not mutually exclusive, so projects will typically ask more than one of these within the same project. So, um, and they're also not hierarchical. There's no one of these that's better than the other, although I am going to say something about the final one, about frameworks, um, once we get to that. So in the taxonomy, there are research questions around what work, like what kinds of practices and approaches are effective. Then there are questions about what is. 
a kind of descriptive inquiry about how students learn, who our students are, what kinds of um, problems teachers encounter within their teaching and so on. What is, what's the lay of the land, what's the environment in which this teaching is happening? And then there are these research questions that are around what um, is called visions of the possible. So this kind of imagining, um, given, a, given a problem that, that exists, what might we be able to create that addresses that problem? So the two that are on the left-hand side of the screen are kind of about what exists already. And then the two on the right are more about, well, what could we make? what might be possible to improve student learning. And then the final one, formulating new conceptual frameworks, models and frameworks that lead to new ways of seeing things or new ways of inquiring. Um, in Australia, in nationally funded research, there have been a plethora of models and frameworks created. And sometimes they create an artificial sense of comfort that a project has done something that has been tremendously worthwhile because there is a colourful, fancy, graphically designed framework that shows the world in a different way. Producing a framework in itself is, um, is not impact, it's just producing a framework. And so long as it stays on paper or on the screen, um, it's really not sufficient. So it's quite a comfortable place for scholarship learning and teaching to stay because we can all, within the comfort of our teams and behind the comfort of our computer screens, we can all make models and frameworks, but the really juicy, interesting, impactful, meaningful work happens when it's about translating that into actual tangible change within units, courses, schools, institutions, discipline groupings, you know, and, and bigger and bigger from there. Um, so I would urge you not to propose something that stops at the we made a new framework kind of level. So um, at this point in the process, I would encourage you to be really expansive. Start with all the research questions that you can think of and then refine them so that they tick all the boxes of um, this checklist, that research questions need to be clear, they need to be manageable. You need to actually be able to execute the research around them. That you have an awareness of what assumptions might be underpinning them, what values and what implications. That they relate to previous research and are significant and useful. And then finally, that um, they are ethical, that they're able to be um, prosecuted as questions in an ethical way that won't cause adverse outcomes. And I think in the most recent webinar we had that Matt ran, um, there was a suggestion to engage with the human research ethics team early on in um, developing your idea, and I would strongly endorse that. Um, talking to um, Marlene, is it two different people whose name is both Sue? Am I yeah. remembering right? <laughs> yes. that? Will be tremendously helpful in getting around the ethical considerations of your work. Yeah, I'll put a I'll put the email address in the chat box so that you can just like direct the email to the group because they've got a team email address. Perfect. Okay, and then the kinds of verbs that you use in the questions um, hint at the sorts of approaches that you're seeking to use. Um, and I've given a list of those there. I'm not going to read through those now, but you'll have them for your reference. And there's a great book um, by Creswell um, about research design and that's where these come from. Good research questions usually start with what or how and they are open questions um, rather than closed questions as in you don't want them to be a yes or no answer. So this also is from Creswell and um, I think it's a really useful way for framing research questions. Sometimes, I don't know what it's like for you, but I have in the past been daunted by writing research questions because it feels like there are thousands of possible questions. There are so many things we don't know about students and student learning and the complexities of education and, and even narrowed down to our particular field of inquiry. I often have a sense of like, well, there's, I could give you so many questions, but I don't know which ones work. 
And so this fill in the blanks exercise um, from Creswell, I think is a fantastic one um, that essentially says like, how or what is the thing um, that we're seeking to understand for participants in a particular context? And you fill in the blanks. Um, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to have a go at that, but I wanna propose one other fill in the blanks for you. Um, this is one that does not exist in Creswell's work, um, and I haven't seen it elsewhere. Um, if you have, please let me know so I can reference it. Um, but I think it's something that um, I developed in preparing these slides. This is for an intervention centered script. So the previous screen is kind of, it's a script about understanding, um, understanding what is. This one is about asking the what works question, an intervention centered script. Script. So like what is the efficacy of intervention X in improving the problem for these people at this place? Let me show you a couple of examples. So the research question filling in the blanks might be, what are the stories of deciding to persist rather than a trip for male school leaver students in first year online nursing students at CCUNI? So encoded in those not very many words, are a whole lot of things. Um, we know that this research is going to be qualitative, right? Um, unless you added in the word, you might say, what are the data stories of deciding to persist? And that would be a quite different question. But here, I pretty much know that this is going to be some kind of narrative inquiry, perhaps oral history, um, perhaps auto, uh, the autoethnography, if you engage student researchers, it's going to be about storytelling. I know that the concern here is that we want to understand what will make students stick around rather than drop out, and that the focus is narrowed down to male students who are mm, between, what would they be, like 17 and 19 years old, um, who've arrived directly into first year online nursing units at CTU. So this question tells us the process of inquiry, the problem, the people, and the place in which the research is going to happen. Um, if you were gonna ask an intervention-based question, a what works kind of research question, you might say something like, what is the efficacy of peer support networks? So you're naming the intervention. How effective are they? In improving retention, that's the end game. Um, the same thing for at-risk male first year nursing students who are enrolled in an online mode. I've got one more example which just models the same thing, but I might pause there and just ask if there's any questions or comments on this, this way of formulating research questions. You don't have to, it's not a requirement, but it's just, I offer it as a useful way in to, to turning your ideas into research questions. Anyone want to comment or add to that? Okay, let's have a look at another one. Um, this is fictional, by the way. I've never been to Bundaberg campus. I don't know if it has a flexible learning space. Um, but the question could be something like, how is culture shared in terms of progression and resilience amongst research higher degree students who are using the flexible learning space on Bundaberg campus. So again, you see a question that is very bounded, that doesn't seek to understand the experience of all RHD students everywhere, or indeed not even all of them at Bundaberg, but the ones who are using this particular architectural location that I've imagined to exist. And, um, and we're not asking RHD students about all of their experiences. We're not asking about you know, scholarly identity or academic integrity. We're asking about progression and resilience. What kinds of culture sharing is going on to, to make them stick around? Um, again, if it was an intervention, a, a what works kind of question, we'd be maybe saying the intervention is a formal program of practice sharing. And so what is the efficacy of that intervention in improving? And again, you'll see those same things repeating progression, resilience, RHD students, et cetera, et cetera. 
So with those examples, I want to give you a couple of minutes now to nut a few of these out for your own research idea. And I've given you on the screen now just those two sets of blanks. Um, you can decide to have a go at one or the other or both. And again, um, I'm not going to invite you to share these, but just I'm going to give you some space to think about them. And because it's kind of a hefty piece of work, I want to give you five full minutes to do it. Um, so let's do that. And I'm going to ask that if you've got questions, feel free to put them in the chat, but let's keep things silent um, so there can be five minutes of like intense concentration for everybody. Would anybody like to share any reflections on that process? You're welcome if you like to share your actual questions, no restrictions on that or if any ideas came up for you during that process, and if you'd like to share with the group to maybe reinforce what we've been working through on research questions. Hello, Anton. Can I, I'm Kazi. Can I ask one question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, since I have long teaching experience, without asking any question to students, still I can explain by using autoethnography. Uh, uh, the student's perception about the complex accounting standard setting process. So it is not a case study. I am the case. I am the teacher. I taught 20 years, so I know how students perceive different complex processes of accounting standard setting. And I can explain that. I will tell about students how do you feel about that, how do you understand that, what is the, uh, the problems in understanding the complex process. And I can use auto ethnography. Eth ethnography. My question to you would be: If the auto ethnography is entirely focused on you as the subject, yes, I wonder how you would go with affecting uh, change within practice more broadly. How yep. are you going to convince colleagues or leadership that things need to be done differently if you're the only story that you can tell? Yes, I am the storyteller and I am the story writer. And I am mm -hmm. the case. I am the case because I have long experience. Researchers do not believe themselves. They do depend on other persons and they do collect data from other persons. But I am the case. I have the experience. I will explain that. That's why I would like to use photo ethnography. I do not need to ask anybody. I will <laughs> explain. So auto ethnography is an ex well accepted accounting, well accepted methodology. So I can use that. How do students perceive the complex accounting standard setting process? And I do not need an ethical clearance because I am the case. Yes. Um, look, if you want to go that way, you know, mm. it might be an interesting experiment. I mean, it's why an EOI is a, is a good thing because you can test it out and see what the panel thinks. Yeah. I, I think the panel would struggle to be convinced that a single case autoethnography mm. could be generalizable and sufficiently impactful to receive institutional funding, I think. But um, but that's a judgment <laughs> call. Um, mm. I think it would be a very risky one. <laughs> uh, it is risky here, but I have seen yeah. I have seen article has been published in the ASTAR level journals based on auto autoethnography. Yeah. So that that is my strength. I have seen that. Um, Articles, a number of articles recently have been published, very recently, have been published in the A-star level journals and A-level journals based on autoethnography. And they did not ask anybody. They are big, big professors. So I do not need an ethical clearance in that case. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have the evidence. I have seen a number of, might be 10 articles. I collected it. It's Maybe a very complex. Either because it's quite a it's a project that wouldn't need to be buying out other people's time or doing other things. Yeah, you could so, just write it. Yeah, so I can write a project about. Let us see how how the panel consider is because I have the evidence that how uh, very recently A star and A level journals entertained that level of articles and they published it. Yeah. Okay, it'll be interesting yeah. to watch how that goes. Make yeah. sure you stay yeah. really on top. The impact yeah. and success question as well. Yeah, I'm um, the case. I'm the case. I'm the writer. Uh huh. But also, how will that case affect change at CQ Uni? How will it leave things? Yes. 
stuff? That's the other bit of the question you've got to ask. Cert certainly, I will explain my experience uh, based on my teaching here, teaching overseas. So, university will get benefit uh, and that will uh, help students in the future. Mm -hmm. That will need yeah. to be very clearly explained in your application. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. If I'm unsuccessful, no problem. I can write an article and submit somewhere because I have the evidence. Yeah. Super. All right. Thank you. Um, anything else, Stephen? Thanks for your note in the chat that it was helpful. Yeah, the phrasing is a bit clunky, right, when you do a fill in the blanks, but um, but it will give you, like you say, it kind of captures the project as a starting point. And Ken, um, helpful in framing the research question, fantastic. Don't feel like you ever need to slavishly stick to this formulation. It really is, is there as a, a starting point. Um, yeah. No rules about needing to actually use it in the final thing that you produce. No, it actually saves a lot of time. Um, getting to this kind of stage of your research can, can take months. So, yes, yeah, it's very helpful as a starting point. So, thank you. Great, fantastic which is a nice segue into what I hope will be another really useful starting point, and that is the Lean Canvas um, for learning and teaching research. Now, there will be several versions of this available on the LTS um, StaffNet page. I think, Marlene, that the generic one is live at the moment and we just need to update the Mac ones. Is that correct? Yes, <laughs> very generic, not, spe not specific to the CQU. Okay. Yeah, so we give this to you in a couple of formulations. The one that you're looking at on the screen, um, I think it's the one that is on StaffNet at the moment. Um, and it could be used anywhere. But then to save you having to do the translation work, we've got another version that maps to the sections of the full proposal template um, so that you can just directly kind of take what you've written here and slide it into the full proposal when you get to that stage. So essentially the idea of the Lean Canvas, and please forgive me if you work in this business and entrepreneurship space, and I'm telling you something that you know really well already. Um, the idea of the Lean Canvas, it emerged as a substitute for lengthy, convoluted, time-consuming business plans um, as a way of quickly capturing the key ideas in a startup um, or a new business idea. Um, the idea of a Lean Canvas is that you complete it fairly quickly and you update it frequently with a willingness to kind of pivot your ideas if they turn out to not have traction. I had encountered Lean Canvases um, and I thought for a while, it'd be so great if there was one about um, research. and. Um, and so I looked around and it turned out actually that colleagues from the University of Western Australia and the University of Auckland had indeed uh, translated the Lean Canvas idea into a research Lean Canvas. Um, I liked it, but there are particular things about scholarship of learning and teaching research that are really distinctive, um, particularly around dissemination and impact um, that meant that the the one that had been developed by Auckland and UWA, I didn't feel like it did enough for us. So um, with their permission, I made a new version of it that we've been using at CQU for about a year and a half now um, that is learning and teaching specific. So not going to go through it in any depth except to say, um, please do jump onto the StaffNet page and have a look at it, see if it's useful in your practice. Um, complete it quickly, update it often. The numbers that you see um, indicate the sequence in which you may wish to complete um, the different boxes. The left-hand side of the page is kind of about doing the research, how will the work get done. And the right-hand side of the page is about what kinds of um, impacts will it make? What will success look like? Who will the strategic partners be? Um, what positions your team to get this work done, and so on. So we use this a lot further down the line in um, supporting you to develop your full proposal, but it seems to me that even at EOI stage, printing this out on maybe an A3 sheet, taking some marker pens and um, sketching and writing 
your responses in each of these boxes. You won't have space to write about all of these things in the EOI because it's intentionally a narrower um, version of your story. Um, but it will really get you clear on how your project's going to happen, why it matters, why you're the people to do it, and what's going to be different afterwards. So Can that is the lean canvas. Mali? I was just going to say there are actually three versions on the StaffNet site. One of them's blank, one of them's an example, and the other one's elaborated and fillable. So the, uh -huh. the proposal ones so are the not fillable there, one but the other three. Fabulous. So, yeah, you've got a bunch to choose from. The fillable one, um, particularly good if you're working as a team and across geographic locations because you can um, fill it within Adobe Acrobat Reader and then share it with your team. Um, or some people like to print it out really big and work on it on paper. Um, whatever works for you, they're there in a bunch of different versions. So that is the Lean Canvas to be returned to as you progress your ideas. And then the little extra bit that I squeezed in um, and mentioned in the overview is just about quality writing. The EOI is brief, and that means it does need to be written really well. So just a couple of reflections really about how to do this. Following the instructions is crucial. The EOI template um, should be read alongside the procedures document. Um, and just make sure that you um, take the steps that the template and the procedures ask you to take. Coherency, being compelling and minimizing your jargon. So again, the review panel, intelligent, thoughtful, non-expert readers of your application, bearing in mind that you might get somebody who turns out to be pretty expert. So make sure that what you're saying is robust enough that they'll be convinced but accessible enough that a non-expert could be convinced. Um, reading your work aloud. How many people do that? Maybe let's just have a, a yes or a no in the text box. Do you read your work aloud for the purpose of improving it? Are you the crazy person in your hallway who seems to be talking to themselves? Yeah, quite a few yeses. Great. I'm such a believer in it. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I've written things that to my eyes look fairly finished and then I read them and I think, what what was I thinking that this was ready? The sentences are too long, there's so many commas, this idea doesn't make sense. Um, so reading aloud is a, a fantastic way to get clarity, punctuation, expression, syntax, everything all lining up. The other way that I'm finding really useful at the moment um, is to switch the mode in which I'm viewing the text. So within, let me take a step back, you know that thing that our brain does of filling in the blanks, we do it all the time, it's the only way that we can make sense of the tremendous amount of stimulation that's like coming into our brain at every moment. And so the same thing happens with our writing the brain is going to be filling in all kinds of information that's not actually there, and that's how we miss mistakes. We substitute in words that we thought should have been written there, it turns out they weren't, and so on. Um, so switching platforms, printing the text out and reading it on hard copy, um, copying and pasting it into an email and imagining that you're going to send it to somebody um, will invariably, for me, reveal a mistake. Sometimes, if I'm drawing on my kind of social media community to help me with writing something. I'll even copy it into, say, a Facebook discussion box. And as soon as I do, invariably, I spot a sentence that's too long or an idea that's poorly formed just because I've switched it out of Word into another visual interface. And the final thing, peer review, engaging colleagues who can critically um, review what you've written. And in brackets, I've said, and I'm, I'm kind of semi-joking but actually quite serious, some not-so-critical friends, some people who can be your cheerleaders and um, remind you that, you know, you're on track to write something great. So have a balance always of um, people who'll tear your work apart and people who find the value in it as well. We always need both. Um, we had questions last year about how you should allocate the space within the EOI. This is my opinion, this is not from the procedures and it's certainly not a rule. 
but my opinion for what it's worth is that you might want to allocate the space in your EOI um, following the percentages that you're seeing on screen now. Absolutely up to you. And the bigger question needs to be, when I show this to people, are they convinced of my argument? Rather than when I do a word count, does it comply to delete suggested space allocation? And make sure you leave white space margins and between paragraphs don't crowd it too much for the reader. Um, I won't go through these, but just you'll have them in the slides, some useful books and some useful... Uh, Julie, I have a question. Yes. As you say, margin, definitely fine, you have to good writing. If someone said my proposal a little bit longer, I want to make the fonts 11 to 9. Then what will happen? If you change the font size from 11 points to 9 points? Yeah, that's right. Then, not, then it will get more space, but it is difficult to read. So that sort of stick <laughs> principle yeah. is there or because it should be readable from the panel members, even other reviewers so far. So that sort of information also we need in the EOI. That's why I asked for the sample. So it could help us. So everyone should write the same way, not squeezing, not changing the uh, template or format. So that was my question earlier, but that is yeah. so far. So um, I think the answer to the nine point font question, no, you can't do that. Um, you need <laughs> I said the template. Example, no, not... um, you can, Marlene, I don't know if I'll get in trouble for saying this, but the one cheat you can do is that the blank space between paragraphs, you could shrink that from 11 point font to something like eight or nine. Um, the blank line in between, not the actual text. Or well, you could just but put paragraph than, spacing in there. What was that, Marlene? You could just put a six point paragraph space in there instead. Oh, you could put in six, even better. Well, yeah, as, as as a of, yeah and a the, little bit the, of yeah, and the the titles of the paragraphs will break that up as well because they're in a different font anyway. And so, yeah, you can save little, little bits and pieces here and there. Yeah. And that reading out loud um, process will save you quite a lot as well. Um, and really using the prompts that are in the EOI, it's written in a really intentionally helpful way. Um, and we welcome feedback on how to do that better, but the prompts are in there to really guide you about what you need to say. Ty, I just saw um, your message about having a chat at the end, and yes, absolutely. Um, I'll hang about for a while. If anybody's got any other questions or points, we can talk about those. Um, so that's it for writing resources. The final link there, word count tools, I just want to emphasize that one. Um, it functions a bit like Grammarly in that you copy and paste your text in and it does a whole lot of analyzing of it for you. But one of the things it does is that it gives you a, um, an average sentence link for your text. And um, it also pulls out your longest sentence in the text. Um, it can be a useful way of reflecting on whether you've been too wordy and convoluted in how you're saying things. Um, I might have these author names mixed up, but I think it's Dickens who has a mean sentence length of 40 words. Um, and then Chaucer is like 35 words and JK Rowling is 12 words in an average sentence. Um, so think about where you wanna be placed on that spectrum in terms of clarity and holding people's attention. And my advice to you is that you'd rather be at the JK Rowling end than the and um, for something like this, keeping it, keeping it as simple as you can, um, showing that you have a real command of what you're writing about because you're able to express it in really simple and compelling ways. So that brings us to the end of the um, slides and we've got 10 minutes left for questions, answers, discussion, um, anything really and then like I was saying um, I'm not rushing off anywhere so we can certainly hang back and and talk longer as well I'll keep the recording on for another 10 minutes and then we can be off the record after that any reflections comments anything 
Yeah, I think presentation is so good. I, I hint on presentation is so good, but what I understand, uh, panel is so conservative because they will see a lot of things. <laughs> so, what we should do? Um, so, how many people you expect to get involved uh, in the particular research project uh, as the participant or contributor? How many? Three, two, or one, or you single person? How many team members per, yeah. per mm -hmm. project? Yeah. Silly, I would say that it would depend on the project. Mm. Yeah, definitely. You have a different idea. <laughs> um, but it, agreed. Um, bearing in mind that the project is attracting either five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars of funding, um, mm. you're not going to be able to support an enormous team, and you're also wanting to complete the outcomes within mm. the year. You have to complete them within the year. So small-ish. But I mean, Marlene, what if we just do a run through of who was funded last year? Were we looking mostly at teams of sort of three or four? Three to five? Yeah. Yeah, and it depends on, as I said before, what the project is, because the expertise of the team members needs to be taken into account. So um, for, the, for the length of the project and the type of project, that's a consideration. So you don't want a whole heap of people that have the same expertise to do one job in the project, you know, to yeah. look after one activity. So, and you also have to get the um, DDLT approval of workload allocation. So, if, if you're putting in in kind contribution for your team members, that has to be approved at the school level. So, mm. you know, it, your team members that you want to put on your project may not have the time to do it which is another consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not everybody involved in your project has to be on the team. It's very appropriate to have reference group members, <coughs> advisors, advocates, people doing other things but not named as team members. Yeah, but my question is, if I am using autoethnography, then I'll be the single participant. So I do not need to involve others because it should be autoethnography. So we in have, that, yeah. I was just going to say we have had one project in the past three years, I think, um, mm. that had one person as the investigator. Yeah. But I mean that was case studies, I believe. Mm. But it was also a workload thing, so you know the the workload was approved by the person's supervisor, and mm. yeah, they had the time to actually complete the project. So it'll depend what the project actually comprises. Oh, okay. And autoethnography um, is not a methodology that I'm intimately familiar with, and so you need to check the literature. But I suspect that it's even more important to collaborate with others in autoethnography to check for biases and blind spots and assumptions that doing it solo would be a, a, a risky thing to do. But the literature will guide you. The methodological literature about autoethnography will tell you how how that works. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Yes, Tilly. Just a quick question for me. Can you uh -huh. hear me? Can you t hear me, Tilly? Yes. Oh, good. Um, look, um, looks like this one is a very long process, and um, I'm aware that the deadline for the um, the, uh, the application um, uh, should be in uh, or should be on the uh, I think 16th of uh, this month so this is just a, a uh, expression of interest um, you know the, the, the brief one not the, the whole uh, application for for the grant right correct yeah um, so do, do we have a format for for that uh, brief um, EOE you do, and that is, where is it, Marlene? Is it by email or is it on StaffNet? I can't remember. I sent it out in the reminder yesterday, and it's also up on StaffNet. Um, so, right. yeah, but I can, I can send it to you. I'll, I'll send it with the resources when I send them. Early. Thanks. Uh, but but I, I think, I, I um, is it from, from us? I should go to the dean and to, to um, uh, uh, endorse it in as a brief application? Or do we need to, to discuss with the dean of the, the school? Marlene? 
Um, at this stage, I don't think the endorsement of the Dean is required. This is an expression of interest. So, I mean, your project, you'll need to get that endorsement later when you put in your final application and probably also at the proposal stage. Like, if you wanted yeah. to get it earlier rather than later, that would probably be a good idea. Yeah. Um, but you won't know exactly what they're going to be endorsing until you actually get your project developed into a format that's going to be researched. So, um, yeah, at this stage, the endorsement's not necessary. Um, with the expression of interest template, it's not in there at all. So, um, yeah. Sorry, so so the, the template that I, the reason I, I need to check with you, because yesterday I think I saw a template, but, but it was about the uh, the endorsement from the dean. So I thought if it's just a brief one, um, it will be, you know, too complicated for the dean to be involved in at this stage. That Maybe means, I read the wrong template or something, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, well this template doesn't have anything about it in there. And I yeah. think it's from the email yesterday, so I'll, I'll forward it on now to you. Thank you, yeah. Well, colleagues, that brings us to the end of our formal time together. Um, I'm going to switch off the recording in just a moment, but invite you to stay back if you have any questions or comments. And I want to wish you all the best in framing your EOI. It's, it's an exciting stage to be at, and the beginnings of what I hope for many of you will be a, a really fruitful development process and research process where ultimately things are made better and better for your teaching practice, that of your colleagues and the experience of your students. So it's really exciting to have you on board and I wish you all the best. And please remember that you can always um, reach out to Marlene and Matt for advice about framing the EOI, especially if you're doing something that you think might be a little radical, um, run it by them because they know the panel and the panel sensibilities very well and um, it could be a good way to test ideas out before you invest in the EOI. That brings us to the end of the workshop, so we'd like to thank you for attending and we'll see you at the next one.